I'd like to now take the opportunity to reintroduce um, Professor David Chen. He's obviously really well known. He's he spoke on nerve aspects in the previous session. Um, David is the president of the American Hernia Society, and um, we're looking forward to your next talk. Thank you very much. And um, David's going to be talking to us about the, the Liechtenstein repair. So, thank you, David. Hello, uh, my name is Dr. David Chen. I'm a professor of surgery at, U at UCLA in Los Angeles. I'm also the director of the Liechtenstein Amid Hernia Clinic. Uh, it's my pleasure to participate in uh, Australia, New Zealand abdominal wall reconstruction. Uh, I have no disclosures. I'm the current president of the America's Hernia Society, and I would love to see all of you guys uh, in September in Austin, where we'll hopefully have a real live meeting. Um, so inguinal hernia, we know that is our highest burden of disease uh, operation in general surgery, 20 million operations worldwide, over 800,000 a year in the United States. And when we think about our outcomes, recurrence is uh, somewhere around 2% in the mesh era is what we like to quote, and significant pain, we like to think about chronic pain being a problem at the 6 to 8% range. So we really want to improve our outcomes with regards to pain uh, and maximize our efficacy with regards to recurrence. And when we talk about types of inguinal hernia repair, you know, there's several different types of inguinal hernia repair, but if we look at kind of the tissue repairs, we know that shoulder ice is the best of these. When we talk about the anterior mesh, Liechtenstein, uh, pr primarily here, we talk about the amid modified Liechtenstein that we'll talk about today. Uh, the changes that PARV has made uh, being the best studied as a preperitoneal mesh repair, you know, everything derives from a stopa operation, but TEP and TAP perform laparoscopically or robotically. These are really our gold standards in surgery. And when we talk about a gold standard that we really like to still refer to Liechtenstein as the gold standard, just because it's the best to compare it to. It doesn't mean that TEP or TAP or robotics or laparoscopic or shoulder ice are any better or worse. It just means that we want a standard to which most people can uh, compare uh, a very um, standardized operation. And so when we talk about our goals for modern hernia repair, we'd like a rate of reduction, uh, rate of recurrence and chronic pain, both of these to be less than half a percent for your patients. What are the benefits of a modified Liechtenstein? So very reproducible, easy to teach, lower learning curve, less complicated anatomy. You can do it under local anesthesia, you can avoid and general. Uh, there's very little risk in terms of visceral or vascular issues as, a, as it's an anterior operation. You can avoid the scarred preperitoneal plane and it definitely is cost effective. This is the construct of a Liechtenstein that instead of sewing tissues together in tension, you bridge and uh, provide a tension-free repair over the inguinal canal. And when you look at this, this is a picture from Don Aquaviva from 1944 and Zagdun also in the 1950s. So you can see that surgeons have come up with this solution as kind of con confluent or con congruent evolution uh, where the, uh, the idea is that uh, Parvizamid and Irv Lichtenstein really developed and worked on were definitely thought of uh, and practiced in other places, but they definitely were the ones that promoted the technique and allowed for widespread worldwide adoption. And so when you look at that, it looks very similar to the original articles. Uh, this was the original conception of a Liechtenstein um, on the left side, and this is the modified, a mid-modified repair described in the 1990s. So uh, from 1984 to 1992, Parvis, uh, Ermid, and Irv Lichtenstein had done over 3,000 surgeries. And from that, they followed these patients between a minimum of one year to eight years. And there were four recurrences. And because of that, Dr. Ermid changed the whole technique because predominantly he felt like every recurrence was technical and we could really do better. So the changes are the mesh became overlapped over the tubercle. Instead of in apposition to the tubercle, it overlapped the tubercle. Uh, running suture on the lateral side, interrupted sutures on the medial side, and we'll show all of these changes. The mesh became bigger, seven by 15 centimeters, so that it could overlap the tubercle and extend over the aponeurotic portion of the uh, conjoint tendon. And then really there was a emphasis on nerve identification. So the nerves are very important that nerve injury and contact, especially with an anterior repair is not always avoidable, but if you always think about the nerves, you can minimize your pain. So iliohypogastric comes to the conjoint tendon, ilioinguinal and genital branch of the genital femoral. You see that there's a lot of variation though sometimes. And so it's important to always think about the nerves. And when we look at this, we know that ilioinguinal is the easiest to find. So we can usually find that right when we open the canal, right under the external oblique aponeurosis. 
the iliohypogastric, you find at the conjoined tendon, right at the cleavage plane of that. But sometimes 10 to 15% of the patients don't have a visible iliohypogastric because it runs a sub aponeurotic course. And if you pull a little more, you can see where it exits. And that course actually runs below the extern the internal oblique aponeurosis. So important to consider that and not run a permanent suture there. Genital nerve is typically identified by the external spermatic vein running within the cremaster. You can see that another example of that. So you want, to rem, you want to preserve the investing fascia that protects these nerves. So some of these old techniques of moving the nerve out of the field were, del were detrimental to the nerve and can cause scarring, as well as passing your fingers under the cord. This is from the original description. So when we say, how did people learn to do this? Well, this is exactly how we published it. So this is because in the beginning, we we uh, copied what was done in a standard Schulteis operation, splitting the cord into, to, into a medial and lateral bundle. But what we found is that this makes a difference in a mesh-based repair because you'd like to keep the mesh away from the cord structure. So this is how we'll go over a Lichtenstein step-by-step. -step. So an incision uh, typically is transverse in longer line, six centimeters. Uh, this is marked out anatomy. We infiltrate with local anesthesia. You can see we make this incision very reliable to find a superficial epigastric and we usually will ligate this and cut it rather than bovine through it. We then will find the external oblique aponeurosis and we'll inject into this underneath the external aponeurosis and this will hydro dissect out the whole canal. The nice thing about this is that once you get this local into this plane, uh, patients are really comfortable and they really can be completely awake and tolerate this operation. Um, we then open up the external oblique and the first thing you'll encounter is, as we talked about, that ilioinguinal nerve running below that. Uh, we then dissect the folds of the external oblique to the conjoined tendon medially and the inguinal ligament laterally. On the medial side, we'll find our iliohypogastric exiting at the conjoined tendon. On the lateral side, we'll find the genital nerve within the cord structure. So we find that external spermatic vein in the blue and genital nerve running with that in the white. The key to the dissection is to really sweep atraumatically along the inguinal ligament and then continue that over the tubercle. If you push over the floor, you'll rip cremaster and if there's a direct hernia, you'll rip transversus abdominis and the transversalis fascia. But if you sweep over the inguinal ligament and then directly over the tubercle, you can dissect that in an avascular plane and then atraumatically isolate your cord as you can see here. And then we will pass, usually I use a pen rose, but here we're just passing an umbilical tape and that isolates the cord. We then uh, look for an indirect hernia. We open up in the direction of the cremasters. And here you can see, you know you're done when you find the vas deferens. A hernia sac will always abut the vas deferens. On the direct side, we evaluate for a direct hernia. You see inferior pogastric vessels here. And in Hesselbach's triangle, we'll see this is inferior pogastric and you can reduce out your direct hernia. There you can see that here. Uh, it's important to always look for a femoral hernia. And so if you have a direct hernia, you open the inguinal floor. If you have a hernia sac, you can go through the uh, internal ring. But what we do is we look and evaluate the femoral canal to see if there's a concomitant femoral hernia because that is uh, the Achilles heel of this operation. If there's something in the femoral canal and you do a planar Lichtenstein repair, you won't address it at all. So once the floor is opened, you can then close it. If the aperture of the internal ring is large, we do a Marcy suture, and then you can run this closed without tension, not like a Bassini, but just to imbricate the floor to allow for a flat landing zone. We then mark out uh, one and a half to two centimeters of overlap over the tubercle, and we'll run that along the inguinal ligament. You can see this is the shape of the mesh, seven by 15 centimeters, shaped like the heel of a foot. And this is kind of fits like this in this space where this will uh, meet the conjoined tendon. What kind of mesh we use? This is from hernia surge. Uh, we just need a strength of 16 nanometers per centimeter square. So any of the large pore uh, monofilament meshes are all adequate here. You wanna fix with permanent suture laterally. And then you can see a centimeter and a half to two centimeters of overlap over the tubercle. And then you're gonna run that all the way to the level of the internal ring. On the medial side, uh, we're gonna then do interrupted sutures. So you split the mesh, and I usually will tell the residents cut that to the halfway point of the cord, pass it underneath. And then on the medial side, we fixate with interrupted absorbable sutures to prevent entrapment of the nerve. So you can see that that's a medial mesh fixation. I can see where the nerve is, and then we can then fixate down. Here you wanna tie an air knot here so that you don't strangle a nerve if it's sub-aponeurotic. 
And then once that's done, you cross the upper tail over the lower tail and affix to the inguinal ligament here. And that will complete the fixation of the mesh. We then trim the tails, usually three to four centimeters of cephalic extent, and that can tuck under the external oblique aponeurosis. That will cover any interstitial hernia or a low-lying spagellian hernia. We then close the external ring to complete the operation, and that, uh, that provides the, the repair. Now, what do you do if you have a femoral hernia? You can make this triangular extension here, and if you had a femoral hernia, it will flop down like a trap door, and we put three interrupted sutures and parachute it down to Cooper's ligament. And then you can see that parachutes in, and then you can continue the lateral fixation as, as normal. And you can see that here is just a modified Lichtenstein. What about glue and self-gripping mesh? So no data to really say that there's a big difference, but there might be a change in time, both for glue and self-gripping, but no difference in pain or recurrence. What about prophylactic neurectomies. So we know that uh, nerve identification reduces pain, but prophylactic neurectomies of the ilioinguinal or iliohypogastric uh, or genital are not recommended. However, if you have a nerve that's at risk, you can definitely do a pragmatic neurectomy and bury the nerve uh, as if you, had a, if you were performing a standard neurectomy. What does hernia surge say about hernia repairs in, in, with Lichtenstein? So TEP and TAP, as well as Lichtenstein, are the best evaluated. Uh, tissue repair, shoal ice can be offered, um, but provided available resources and expertise, the newest recommendations are that minimally invasive techniques have benefits. What does the data show? Well, when we look at the data from the EHS guidelines and from hernia surge, if you actually look at the source data, so both for recurrence uh, here and for severe chronic pain, there's really very minimal difference with recurrence actually favoring Lichtenstein. But if you look at uh, this registry um, study from Annals of Surgery from our friends in Germany with hernia surge, 58,000 patients, what they find is that there's some benefits to TEP and TAP. But when you look at the data, very minimal difference, 3.4 versus 1.7% complication rate, pain rates 5.2 versus 4.3. So it just tells you that, yes, there's some benefits of MIS, but Lichtenstein remains a very good operation. So what are our tips? Perfect one uh, go-to operation for open would uh, say that your best option is a Lichtenstein and then local anesthesia can be a benefit ideally repair with a flat mesh. Uh, think about your inguinal nerves, have a plan for femoral or con contamination and definitely know a good tissue repair. Uh, this is Dr. Lichtenstein and Dr. Amid who are my mentors and um, I'm always, uh, the door is open for us for anybody that uh, needs, needs any advice or wants to learn anything. Um, love to see you all in person. Thanks so much. Thank you, David, very much for a very uh, clear talk with uh, bringing out anatomy of uh, the nerve specifically at surgery and also modified method of Lichtenstein, leaving the door open for newer options. Thank you very much.